It's the early morning of May the 27th, 1913. The newly formed Royal Flying Corps have an airfield at Montrose in Scotland. It's the first of its kind in Britain. Doing his pre-flight checks on his trusty BE-2 biplane is 29-year-old Lieutenant Desmond Arthur. The 60-horsepower engine takes a couple of tries to get started, but then the bird springs to life. Adjusting his goggles, Arthur signals for the chocks to be pulled away, chocks away man. and the plane starts to drag along the airfield. Arthur is an experienced pilot for the time, and just at the right speed, he eases the controls, and the B-2 lifts gently into the air. Gaining altitude, Arthur still feels the thrill and excitement of this technological marvel. He set a course for Lunan Bay. It's an amazing spot of natural beauty, and from the air, Arthur gets a view that's only been available to the birds just a few years earlier. What a time to be alive. <laughs> King of the world! Arthur pushes the controls forward and starts to descend to 2,500 feet, or around 750 meters, when disaster strikes. A spar on the right side of the top wing snaps, and the entire wing folds up. The plane tumbles violently and gets thrown around its axis as it plummets to the ground. In the death throes of the BE-2, Arthur's seatbelt snaps and he's thrown out of the tumbling mass of wood, wire and cloth. The crumpled remains of Lieutenant Desmond Arthur were found, 150 meters from the crash site. This was the early days of flying and crashes were not unheard of. However, Arthur was an experienced pilot. The Royal Aero Club produced an official report stating that the wing had broken due to a botched repair. But in the summer of 1916, rather than have the issue of explaining faulty repairs, an official government investigation concluded that Lieutenant Arthur had died through his own incompetence through bad flying, effectively dishonoring the memory of this young aviator. Shortly after the government report was issued, Major Cyril Foggin was looking forward to reading the newspaper and maybe even getting a decent cup of tea in the officer's mess. Rounding a corner, he stopped dead in his tracks. Foggin was a military man and not easily given to fear, but his blood ran cold, and that cold feeling crept its icy fingers down his spine as he saw a ghostly figure, dressed as a pilot, heading into the officer's mess before vanishing. Foggin was dumbfounded. He decided not to make an official report of the sighting for fear of ridicule or even losing his job. He must have been comforted when the ghostly apparition was seen by more and more people. A senior flight instructor had his sleep interrupted, waking with a start in a room lit by the stove fire. He saw a man sat facing him in full flight gear, just at the end of his bed. From his bed, the instructor shouted out, Who the bloody hell are you? And what are you doing here? Guest sat, motionless, silent as the grave. With the instructor jumping out of his bed, the evening intruder just disappeared. More and more people saw this uninvited apparition, but only up to then in the old number two mess where Lieutenant Arthur had lived just three years prior. One night, two men on guard duty were at the base, talking to each other, trying to relieve the boredom. Still two more hours till the next shift. Is it just me or did it get colder? When out of the gloom, a figure emerged. Something wasn't right. He walked towards the guards and they saw him coming from a distance. Ominously, he just kept on walking towards them. Stop. They called out, but the figure kept on walking. Stop right now. Challenging him to stop, we'll shoot. the image flickered. The two men abandoned their posts and fled, terrified of the apparition they'd seen. Summoned by their commanding officer, what do you two men have to say for The guards were questioned as to why they, in a gross dereliction of duty, had abandoned their posts. Sheepishly, the two men told the story of the ghost, expecting ridicule from the commanding officer. Instead, all charges were dropped. The haunting was well known and felt by all who had served on the base, including the commanders. In the end of 1916, investigative teams looked at the B-2 crash afresh and castigated the review board it was obvious that the faulty repair had been made on the spar of Lieutenant Arthur's plane and had been patched up shoddily. This reinstated the reputation of the fallen pilot, and at the same time, the haunting stopped. 
But at the outbreak of World War II, the activity started once more. In 1940, a pilot of a hurricane was coming in to land at night. The ground crew saw the hurricane on final approach, power up and go around again before landing. Exiting the plane, the pilot blustered at the ground crew. Who's that damn fool in a biplane who cut me up? The ground crew had no explanation about the ghostly biplane. There's a ghost in there. They told me this place was haunted. In the war years, the sightings continued with workers saying they could hear a bang and then see the ghost coming through the doors of the morgue. Why would a ghost be coming from the morgue? Well, previously, that location had been the officer's mess. By 1949, any newcomers to the Montrose Air Base were given a printed document as part of their familiarization with the base, informing the staff that the camp was haunted by the youngest ghost in the Royal Air Force, an officer named Flight Lieutenant Arthur. Oh. One sighting was by a Scottish clerk who woke to see an officer in a white flight suit and wearing an officer's hat, casually standing by a desk examining papers. The spectre stopped at the knees and seemed to be floating in midair. The clerk was naturally terrified. But one of the best sightings was attributed to Sir Peter Macefield in 1963. On May the 27th, he was flying his chipmunk over Montrose. Montrose had now been closed for several years. It was a beautiful clear day. Macefield put his plane into a turn over Lunan Bay and started flying along the shore. Ahead of him, at a similar altitude, he saw a strange sight of a biplane. As he got closer, he was amazed to see it was a BE-2 trainer of the type used by the Royal Flying Corps before World War I. Flying alongside, Sir Peter saw that at the controls was a pilot in a leather flying helmet with goggles and a scarf billowing as the ancient plane powered along. Macefield was an aviation expert and knew that there weren't any more of these flying. Maybe a few reproductions, but this one looked, well, perfect. He then watched in horror as the right wing snapped and the BE-2 went crashing towards the ground. Sir Peter put in an emergency landing on the golf course nearby and shouted for help for the stricken pilot. Help. Strangely, Did you see the crash? no one else had seen the crash. Ambulance. I haven't seen anything. What about you, Goldfinger? Rushing to where he had seen the plane go down, there was no wreckage to be found. Nothing. Just the peace of late May in the Scottish countryside. When he went to write up his logbook, he saw that the date was 27th of May, 1963, exactly 50 years since Desmond Arthur's fatal accident. In recent years, the air base has reopened as a museum that you can visit today. The Montrose Air Station Heritage Centre is located to the north of Montrose in Scotland. The ghostly goings-on continue at the museum. In 2010, to the astonishment of the staff, an old radio in the airfield's 1940s room, suddenly began broadcasting speeches by Winston Churchill and the music by the Glenn Miller Orchestra, the Allies' favorite band during the Second World War. The Pi Valve wireless radio wasn't power and had no aerial. The broadcasts come on seemingly at random and can last for up to 30 minutes. Technicians from the museum have examined the radio and taken it apart but found nothing but cobwebs and spiders. 100 years after the accident of Lieutenant Desmond Arthur, the museum decided to lay a wreath at the grave of Lieutenant Arthur. Dr. Dan Patton, the curator of Montrose Air Station Heritage Centre, said in an article in the Scotsman newspaper, is there a Montrose ghost? And is it Desmond Arthur? While there are certainly recent sightings of apparitions of men in flying dress which defy rational explanation, but we should remember that hundreds of men were killed at Montrose over two world wars. Circumstances point to the existence of many ghosts. As far as Lieutenant Arthur is concerned, he returned briefly for a purpose. And once he was cleared of the blame for the accident, he departed. We should let him rest in peace. All the same, on Monday, when we lay a wreath on his grave, I shall be watching the skies around Montrose.
Hope you like our new channel. For more Yarn Hub mystery, please like and subscribe. Thank you.